Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us back here for the third issue briefing of this year's annual meeting of the new champions here in Dali. And welcome also to our audience watching us live online at weforum.org. This issue briefing is about frontier research. Now, at the annual meeting of the new champions, we look far ahead into the future, into the disruptors of the disruptors of today. The title of this particular session is Ambitious Research, a Key Ingredient for Europe's Growth. And I'm very pleased to announce my panel. On my immediate left is Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, President of the European Research Council, based in Belgium. Carlos Moedas, Commissioner of Research, Science and Innovation of the European Commission and a co-chair of this meeting. Welcome back, sir. And very pleased to be joined by Professor Paniota Puirazi, Research Director of the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology at the Foundation for Research and Technology in Greece. So a range of perspectives on European research. I'm going to start by asking Commissioner Moedas to give us your vision for frontier research in Europe and what it means exactly. Thank you so much and thank you again for all of you to, to be here. Um, first of all, I would like to say that um, how lucky we are in Europe to have uh, the European Research Council. Uh, how lucky uh, scientists are to have such an independent body that actually looks after researchers takes care really of giving them the opportunity to do what they love which is science and so I'm, I'm very honored to be here um, uh, just with the president and uh, also the vice president of the European Research Council uh, because uh, for me it's really one of the most amazing projects uh, of Europe and so when when you ask me about my vision the vision for uh, frontier research from frontier science curiosity-driven research. First, uh, my vision is that I hope that in the future politicians will give the right value to science and to fundamental science as the ingredient to innovation, as the main ingredient to growth. And for that, we'll have to have the scientists also helping us politicians to pass on that message the scientists being more vocal in terms of the importance of the science they do for our daily lives. You know, because a lot of people in their day to day, they cannot relate to the fundamental science. They do not understand that science and they don't know that what they actually are doing, having every day in their lives depends or not on that fundamental science being done. Then. My vision for uh, science is that we would create the conditions at some point to have more and more politicians, one, lowering down the barriers for scientists to do science, and secondly, that science could have the same approach that we have in the ERC, meaning for that that it's a total bottom-up approach, that scientists can pick what they love and what they want to do, and then politicians will actually put the money for them to do it. And when I meet uh, ERC grantees, uh, they basically come to me telling me that this is the best thing that happened in their lives. Not because of the money, but because of the network, because of the experience, because of the people they meet and the opportunities that it creates for their lives. And so I see it as the model for the future. And then my vision, I'm not a scientist, I, I'm a politician, but um, uh, I look at the future and what I see in terms of science, and that's, I think, one of the subjects we, we should discuss here today, is that science is more and more about an intersection in between different fields of science. And uh, if we don't actually catch that opportunity of breaking the silos in education, that people can actually have the opportunity to work in different fields, from humanities to science to social science to different parts and different uh, disciplines, then there will be no new uh, innovation, no science that will actually change uh, the world. So I see it, uh, and that's one of the reasons that I'm here in this uh, great country, uh, to actually try to make possible for Europe to work more and more with China, 
to have more and more collaboration. And so I'm really happy uh, that uh, Professor Bourguignon was able to set up an agreement in between uh, the ERC and actually the Natural Science Foundation that will allow scientists to travel from one place to another to do science, to have and uh, experiment different fields with different cultures and doing better science. So I, that will be just the introduction uh, that I would make here today. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I just note for our, um, our audience here and, and online, well, the, the, the general um, tradition here for issue briefings is we ask a, one or two introductory questions to our guests and then we open the floor to questions. We've also been curating questions and collecting questions from our social media audiences, so, um, so hopefully we'll have a, a free-flowing and interactive conversation. And with that, on that note, um, Commissioner gave me a very good segue to the question I was going to ask uh, the Mr. President here regarding the globalization of science. So you've recently con concluded a, an agreement with China. Tell me about the globalization of scientific research. Well, first of all, I think the, the key point, the key point to, to make is, of course, that uh, historically, as science has always been an uh, international endeavor, and there were really no boundaries to the development of science. Uh, it's true that uh, historically, Europe has a very great tradition in science, but uh, it would be a big mistake for Europe to close on itself and believing that uh, you can just rely on this tradition. There are fantastic developments in science. Of course, uh, America has been uh, taking the lead in some uh, areas, uh, clearly, uh, since the Second World War. But now Asia is also extremely uh, developing at a fantastic pace, and uh, China in particular. But not only China. I mean, Korea, Japan are really countries which now count uh, very much in the, in the development of science uh, in many, many different disciplines. So uh, it's very clear that uh, because of the, the very nature of, uh, of science altogether, but also in the, the way the scientists are functioning, in particular the, the fact that now it's available uh, the, the really uh, technical tools to really share knowledge uh, in, in ways which, uh, of course, were unheard of. And uh, sometimes you had to wait for letters to arrive. Now you, you get it just uh, next minute uh, on your on your computer, and, and so therefore, um, we have to take this into account. That this uh, this globalization has affected science very much. The circulation of ideas, circulation of uh, documents, circulation of papers, uh, as as um, is going at a fantastic pace. And so, from this uh, from this um, point, it's very clear that the European Research Council, which is one of the vehicles that the European Commission has uh, built to develop science in Europe. As uh, Commissioner Moedas said, uh, it's really the, the, the bottom-up uh, program of the Commission, which uh, gives a fantastic freedom to the uh, scientists altogether, but also a fantastic responsibility to the Scientific Council to, to really make the choices, how to spend the money, how to do the selection. So it was uh, very clear that from this uh, analysis of this globalization, we must uh, open uh, it. The program is open to the whole world, but we should make it uh, very well known and should uh, create opportunities for scientists from many different countries to really uh, participate also in the teams that uh, the, the ERC grantees, I mean, the grantees, people who get support from the European Research Council, uh, really um, are building because the, the whole point of uh, providing them with uh, money is, of course, to, enabling, to en enable them to really uh, build uh, the, around them, the, bring to around them the right people to, to, do the, to achieve the program they, they set for themselves. And so um, the, it was very natural to, to start uh, this um, search for collaboration with the uh, United States on one hand, and then the uh, next country was Korea, and then came uh, Japan, and then China. And uh, I was very pleased um, um, when I took office uh, just 18 months ago that we could actually achieve uh, signing formally and really getting to uh, putting in place agreements with both the National Science Foundation of China and also the Japan Society for Promotion of Science in a very short time because usually international agreements could take uh, years to, to, to really uh, be completed. In our case, it uh, just took uh, not even nine months. So it, uh, it was very, I was very pleased. So it showed the interest on both sides to, to get uh, through and also the understanding for the various uh, people who had to look into the technicalities to make it happen. So I hope this um, 
exchange programs who will be functioning. So it will mean that uh, Chinese researchers or Japanese researchers or Korean researchers will be able to participate in, uh, in, uh, in projects in ERC in ways which uh, we hope will be also for them um, if uh, they really um, appreciate the, the, the kind of very special uh, system that the ERC is, that maybe they will become themselves uh, principal investigators. And uh, the, the way it is set up is uh, you don't have to be Europeans to apply. You don't have to have a full-time position in Europe. You have to be at least half the time in Europe. So I hope this will be a very good basis for science uh, to be developed by researchers from all around the world with a base in Europe, but also with a, a foot and collaboration uh, in other countries. Thank you. Paniota, you uh, are a practicing researcher, I believe in the area of neurotechnology, correct me if I'm wrong. Tell me a bit more about the prospects for people such as yourselves, young scientists. You're also, I, I should say, proud to be um, introduced, introduced as a member of our young scientist community. So what are your prospects uh, breaking so, new science in, uh, in Europe at the moment? So thank you for this question, Oliver. Um, as a young scientist myself, I would say that I feel lucky. I feel lucky because we live in exciting times for science. The advancement of technology in many disciplines like medicine, biology, and engineering now allows us to answer questions that we couldn't even think of asking 50 years ago. For example, now we can tell which neurons in a mouse brain contain a particular memory, and we can identify the mutations that we pass on to each one of our children. So it's really a privilege to be a young scientist in these uh, times. Um, the other thing that our generation has experienced is a massive growth in the worldwide size of the scientific community. More, more and more people continue their education in pursuit of a career in academia or the research sector. Unfortunately, the, in Europe in particular, we don't have the capacity to absorb all these people. Many of them are not able to fund their research, are not able to establish excellence and secure a job in the academic sector. And that's where the European Research Council comes in. And as the Commissioner Moeda said, it's an absolutely wonderful funding scheme in Europe because it supports young scientists in particular. Through the ERC starting and consolidator grants, young scientists are allowed to pursue their dreams. They are given their early on independence and a long horizon of five years to pursue the questions that they are interested in. For me in particular, getting an ERC starting grant was, I would say, a life-changing experience. Coming from a country where the funding opportunities are very limited, I had to adjust my, my research according to where the money is. When I got an ERC grant, though, I was finally able to do what I really wanted, what I loved the most. And I think this is really important. It's not just the money. It's the opportunity to pursue your dreams. And if you pursue your dreams, that's when the great discoveries come, because you have to have passion for what you're doing. And it's really great to have been funded by the ERC, and we need more of it in Europe and the world. So that's, I think, where we stand now. Commissioner, I hope that message was received loud and clear, more funding for young scientists. And uh, now we'll just take a brief pause, see if there are any questions from the floor. OK, well, we have a few from social media. Um, we, look at, we like looking at what's hot and what's trendy and, and what's going to be big disruptors of the future. One of the questions we had, in fact, many of the questions we had were, were what are the key trends to look for in frontier research? What, what, is, what is exciting in terms of um, g gaining traction for funding for, for new research? Um, perhaps Mr. Bourguignon, you could give us an answer to this one. Well, I think, uh, as it was said, I mean, there are many, many areas in science which have been uh, really transformed by the access to new technologies. But one has to be a bit careful with this. That is, uh, believing that technology alone is enough. Actually, what is really has been really uh, transformative for, for the science has been the, the fact that new technologies uh, allowed people to test new theories. So this balance between theory and experiment uh, in a sense, has, has, uh, has uh, also been moved to a uh, move forward in a very explicit way. Uh, in my own field, for example, which is uh, I'm a mathematician, uh, it's, it's quite uh, extraordinary to see the, the number of areas in which now mathematics is relevant, and uh, which was uh, not the case some time ago. And of course, it comes back to the discipline with completely new challenges. That is, problems people never thought about would become really uh, extremely important to solve. 
And uh, of course, if you want just to have one buzzword, which is clearly in many people's mind, you, you can think of uh, big data as a new frontier. And of course, it has a technical side because uh, big data means uh, having instruments which allow you to share data in a proper way. But it would be a mistake to believe it's a purely technical issue because actually uh, the, the key element is, of course, to from this data <coughs> that you are collecting, you, you need to confront them with uh, new theories or new approaches. And uh, again, if I you allow me to take my own discipline, of course it shows that uh, the importance of statistics or um, of uh, which has been sometimes a neglected subject, which now has, is becoming again a very central subject for the development of mathematics, but in ways which is not uh, separated from very deep and uh, important mathematics, both from the, um, uh, I mean, the, the part of which is uh, probability theory, the part which has to do also with combinatorics, so and the part also which has to do with geometry, because a lot of the new statistics you have to deal with are actually statistics of images, and nobody has been able so far to really come up with a good uh, conceptual way of approaching uh, statistics of images. So you see this, uh, the, one has always to keep in mind that the development of science, which always has been dependent on technical tools, cannot uh, go forward really in a significant way if you, it's not accompanied by new uh, intellectual and sometimes very abstract challenges. Pariota, perhaps, perhaps yourself, you know, what's the So I might be a little you? bit biased, but I think the brain is the ultimate frontier. And if we're talking about frontier science, we're talking about the brain. And this is already becoming evident, evidence, evidence, sorry. Uh, given the funding and the effort that has already been dedicated to brain research, I think for the next 10 or 50 years, we'll be trying to understand how the brain works. And the other reason I think the brain is great is because in order to understand it, you need many people to work together, many disciplines to collaborate. You need to develop the technologies in order to study it. You need to develop the people who will analyze the data. So you need better statistics, you need better mathematics. You need the theoreticians that will model what we're seeing in order to get you know, a global understanding of how the system works. So I think it's an area which combi combines pretty much all of the disciplines. It's still very far from being understood and it's also a, a reason for a serious economical burden in Europe and the world. And I'm talking about mental diseases. We can't really treat them because we don't understand how the brain works. So we have many incentives for going after the brain. And I hope we'll see many discoveries in the near future. Commissioner, any strategic priorities for yourself? No, I, 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 yes, but I just uh, wanted to chip in here um, uh, what the professor was saying that one of the major projects we have in Europe uh, is actually about how you will map the brain. And it's a 1 billion euro 10 year project. And, and uh, so I just wanted to uh, point that out because it's really, I agree with you, it's definitely uh, one of the, the points and one of the major and important fields for the future. But, you know, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but what I see is that in the future, you will really have a big opportunity that I would say it's big data, but it's how you actually merge the big data with the physical world. And so you have been uh, up to a point where you have amounts of data, you have amounts of information, but so far, actually, the decision that you can take upon that data is not yet intelligent, meaning that machines with machines are not taking in yet uh, the right decisions based on the data and the overwhelming data that we have. Why? Because probably we need more mathematics, we need more statistics, we need to get ahead to actually get uh, basically to what we call going from the internet of things to the age of intelligent things. And I think that the frontiers would be in between these two worlds, the physical and the digital. Uh, but again, I think that you should listen to the, the specialists and the scientists and not to me because they know better. Okay, we'll take another pause, see if there are any questions from the floor. The gentleman, can we have a microphone, please, sir? Could you just take the microphone and uh, introduce yourself, please? Hi, uh, my name is Adrian from UCL. I'm one of the young scientists. And I'm just trying to connect the dots. Um, I think I share your enthusiasm for the brain as a final frontier. Um, I think there is some aspect to that endeavor which has intrinsic interest 
Um, but I wonder, just as a counterpoint, for those who would say, um, we recognize that science is a global endeavor. A lot of people are interested in the brain, so somebody is going to investigate it. And it, when we think about budget cuts for a particular area, um, how, how does one quantify the impact of investing in research on the brain in, say, the European zone? And how can scientists contribute to the understanding of that economic impact? From a purely financial perspective, why should a particular region invest in brain research? It's a very, uh, very interesting and uh, a very good question. Uh, and it goes a little bit back to um, what I said about the vision of having, as a policymaker, a more bottom up approach than a top down. Because uh, at the end of the day, uh, politicians can make choices and have visions and look at the future. But uh, I think that it's up to, to the scientists to tell us where they want to go. Uh, and so uh, I agree with you that uh, it's very difficult. Uh, it's probably one of the most difficult things as a policymaker is actually to decide on what are the fields uh, that you should put your money. And so I think that one of the changes that we've done in Horizon 2020 is actually to go more into that field of having bottom-up approaches. Uh, and the ERC is the greatest example of that, but uh, again, we in Horizon 2020, uh, which is the big umbrella, we have a whole pillar that we call the societal challenges. And those societal challenges is also a way to tell the scientists, really tell us what you can do for those societal challenges and don't come up with an answer that is based on a discipline. Come up with a, with a, with a consortium of different disciplines to solve that problem. But um, uh, absolutely, that's what keeps politicians awake at night. That's that question. Okay, let's move on to the subject of public-private cooperation. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask this question because we had another issue briefing this morning on the digital transformation of industries and one of the, um, the comments raised was that whilst 80% of chief executives feared disruption, only 8% had a plan for it. And one of the other statistics we heard from one of the panelists was that <coughs> too many businesses view innovation as digitizing their existing business but not disrupting their own business and, and casting their mind into the future and, and, and reinventing their, their business. So, as the, uh, an institution for public-private cooperation and, and as somebody who knows it's very close to your heart, how successful are you at fostering true collaboration between research and science and business and, and, and the policy space? Perhaps the, Mr. Bourguignon. Well, I'm, I'm not exactly the right person to be asked this question, although we are quite um, keen at the level of scientific council to make sure that uh, some of the uh, researchers we are funding, uh, ERC grantees, uh, are really, uh, we help them to, to uh, I mean, get uh, in this direction if they feel that they should do. So we have a specific program uh, which uh, we call uh, Proof of Concept, which helps uh, researchers if they feel along the way of doing their research that there is uh, something they are doing which can branch off to either something more connected to industrial development or something more connected to societal challenges. We want to help them to look into that direction and uh, to do it uh, in a very simple way. And so, of course, the amount of money we dedicate to this is not so huge, but uh, what we can say, it's much bigger than we thought we would be dedicating because actually uh, a quite significant number of researchers are interested in this and we get a very, very good uh, project from this. And actually they are in the room, some of the ERC grantees who have been very successful at getting uh, ERC, uh, the proof of concept uh, grants and uh, we're, who are developing their companies and uh, actually uh, really passing to the next stage of really having a, a true uh, de industrial development or connection, very direct connection to industry for their development. So I think uh, certainly the issue you're raising is a very, very important one because that's the, the connection between new knowledge and actually new economy and how do you make the link and how do you make the link successfully. And of course the only way it's uh, well known is by taking risk 
and uh, by trying a number of things, and some of them develop fantastically well, and some that less uh, less well. But uh, uh, it's very important that actually also on this we accept the concept of taking risk, which uh, for the scientific community is not so obvious because it tends to be conservative and wants to bet only on things which are sure. And uh, definitely, you, that's why at the level of ERC we do encourage the uh, evaluators to really take risk and look for ambitious projects. Yoto, do you, would you like to work more or less with the private sector? What's your view on this? I think if we look at the places like the US, where they are, do, they are very successful in incorporating the private sector into the They have the scientists developing their way of thinking, if you like, towards what can be helpful for the society. So, so I think it's for the benefit of both sides to work together, absolutely. What is a little bit risky, I think, with Horizon 2020, for example, is to ask everybody to be in the same part. I, th I think what, that, what the ERC is doing is better. So you have the basic research being developed first. You have an idea, and then you think about how you turn this into a product. You separate the two processes. And I think that's more productive in the end than trying to do both things at the same time. But definitely, we would like to see more of the private sector getting, into, getting interested about science and funding basic science with a goal to ultimately get a product out of it. And just to stay in your, your, your area, please, Commissioner, uh, you know, forgive me. Uh, are you, the, the, obviously, the, your, your, your focus on neurotechnology, but are, are there any industries that are seeing value in your research that you may not think are particularly obvious? Are there any? Well, if they are, I would like to know. <laughs> How would I know? I mean, there are many companies, big companies like Google, for example, who is investing a lot of money on artificial intelligence and understanding the brain, speaking from my own experience. experience. Uh, so there are these companies, and I don't know really how, um, how are the opportunities for people, young people in Europe, in accessing these companies. I think they are very limited compared to people in the US or other places where this culture of collaboration between the industry and the academic uh, world is much more developed than it is in Europe. So we have a disadvantage there that we need to work on. Commissioner. Uh, no, I just think that's the crucial, uh, the 10 million dollar question or 10 million euro in this case of me, um, which is basically how you uh, create the conditions for the private sector to invest more in research and development. When you look at the target for research and development in Europe that was set as to get to a level of 3% of GDP invested in research and development, the idea is that 1% would be from the public side and 2% from the private side. And what we see that is happening is that actually on the level of the public side, I mean, we're not that far, but on the private side, uh, we are quite far. And so what are we doing wrong? Why our companies are not investing more in research and development? Why are the European companies not somehow investing in hiring scientists? So that's the question that we have to, to answer, which has a lot to deal with a Europe that uh, is actually on the making, a Europe with uh, a labor market that works better than it works today, that is not fragmented in 28 different countries, uh, a product market, a judicial system that uh, is more alike in between the different countries, because in these age and time, if you don't have speed and scale, there's nothing you can do. And so companies need that speed and scale. And for that speed and scale, they really, really need uh, for a flexible uh, way of looking at the market in general. And so that's uh, one of the biggest challenges we ever had. But uh, times are changing. And I think that uh, in Europe, times have changed in terms of countries getting at least the awareness of the need for those reforms. And, and those reforms are going ahead very quickly. And uh, the numbers yesterday from Europe show that uh, Europe is growing, that on the second quarter, basically all the countries, except for one that had zero growth, all the countries are, are back to growth. So something is changing. Thank you. And uh, this meeting being itself at the intersection of business, science and technology, I'm hoping that we'll have more answers or, or insights into that very tricky 10 million euro question over the coming two or three days. I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us here on the panel and thank you uh, for joining us here in the room and online. This issue briefing is now closed.